Stella Macbeth Kane is a professional shucker who loves to shuck oysters for a living. I talk one-on-one -on -one with her about what's going on in her world these days for this edition of Quentin's Close-Ups. And if you haven't already, subscribe to my YouTube channel and like Quentin's Close-Ups on Facebook. Isabella Macbeth, welcome to Quentin's Close-Ups. Thank you for having me. Oh, you're very welcome. Needless to say, you are a household name here in the low country, particularly with the food and beverage industry, as you are affectionately called the Holy City Maven. And we all know that you love oysters and are a professional shucker because you have shucked professionally for over many, many years. So let me ask you this, Miss Isabella. What's new? What's down with you? Uh, right now, I've uh, left the actual restaurant full time. I've spent 10 years, as many know, running some of the best raw bar programs in the country. Uh, and I'm launching my own LLC where I do oyster pop-ups, catering. Uh, mainly want to focus on an educational aspect and also some consulting for uh, places around the country that might be opening up in the oyster game. So. What is the state of the oyster game as you see it? Uh, definitely on the rise. Uh, I think um, farming has become more, I wouldn't say commonplace, but as far as the average individual in our country, they understand the farming practices. Uh, so they're more open to eating and enjoying them. Uh, more farms are coming up. More oyster shuckers are starting to see it as a pathway, not just to pay the bills, uh, but to grow as a sommelier and a master guild has started up. Uh, with uh, some of the brightest minds from around the world. Uh, so it is definitely on the rise. And, you know, I expect great things in the next 10 years for it. Okay, in the next 10 years. So what are the trends are you, that you're currently looking at when it comes to oysters? Uh, trends, I think we're still kind of fighting uh, kind of the R month rules and where that comes from. You know, can we're in South of South Carolina. Can we eat oysters year-round? Yes, we can. Um, there's a safe way to do it through the farming, as I mentioned, which is on the rise in our understanding of that. Uh, up north, you could probably eat oysters, um, you know, year round from the wild set to the farms. Uh, but yeah, that's still something we're trying to like work through and get everyone behind. Uh, inside of ourselves, uh, the Oyster Master Guild and bring up our knowledge uh, for like those in North America about all five species you know, how the different variants of those species ended up like there's a East Coast oyster that's uh, grown out in the uh, Northwest, but that got shipped over uh, by trains, you know, in the late 1800s, early 1900s, because they had over eight, uh, pretty much the extinction, their native oyster. So they actually shipped in shipping carts, uh, railroad carts that were actually designed to carry oysters over, they'd dump them in the bay, so that the oysters could like filter and live a little bit for a couple of days before they ate them. But they did what oysters did. They started spawning. And so now they have East Coast oysters over there. We have some uh, European ones up in Maine. So really bringing up our inside knowledge up to that level as we continue to work on maybe some of the smaller nuances like the R month rule uh, is really what with main focus for us right now. And I think in 10 years, we're going to be so far beyond that. Uh, you know, you're going to see raw bars with 20, 30 different varieties. Shuckers going to be able to be like, this is the wine you should have, but this one, you know, but we're working towards that. So, yes, ma'am. And, and I wanted to ask you this too, but what else should we be educated about right now when it comes to oysters? Um, I mean, I definitely think, uh, keeping in mind, uh, safety protocols when you're going out and eating, I love seeing an oyster shucker work on a raw bar. Um, that is kind of like my first thing to make sure that I can see the product and see what they're doing, how they're handling it to know I'm getting a good, uh, you know, plate of oysters, um, paying attention to how it's shucked, uh, you know, like sometimes they go in too hard on the back and they puncture right into the shell, you know, they can scramble it up, uh, for yourself. That's not really going to give you the best bite, you know, this best sensation, um, so I like to try to get people to start paying attention to that kind of stuff uh, a little bit more than saying, oh, it's June. Can I eat these oysters? Because if they're already on the raw bar, uh, they've probably been certified by our health department, our natural resources department. Um, so keeping that in mind is still a thing. But more so, I would say people should just pay attention to how the shuckers are working 
and how the, the tray is presented to them so that they get the best experience. And so let me ask you a simplistic question. Is it, and it's an obvious question too, Miss Isabella. But what is a good oyster these days? Uh, good oyster, you know, because the different varietals, there are actually five different species in North America. Uh, so we can get flavors from like cucumber and melon, you know, sweet notes like uh, sugar, or we can get really like briny salt, sea salt, clean salts, you know, we can get earthy metallic tones. So figuring out like what you want as far as your flavor profile, like if you like white wine or red wine, um, that is completely on you. Uh, as a con constant is how the oyster is shucked and also kind of how it's farmed and grown. So the farmed oysters, we're looking for something between two and uh, two and a half and three inches in length and probably about uh, an inch in depth for the cup. That's going to give you a lot of good mouthfeel and a nice plump oyster to have on your tray. Um, we're also going to look at the shucking technique. So when you go in through the back, if you hinge shuck or if you're a Chesapeake, they'll go through the bill. Um, but you pop up the shell a little bit, cut off the adductor muscle. It's not punctured or cut or anything. It's left as it is. Mm -hmm. Sliced off the bottom shell so it will come out smoothly when you tip it back. You don't have to sit there and struggle or get a fork and knife out, you know. Um, those are, that is what a good oyster is as far as the shucker is concerned, is how well it's shucked. As far as the guest, you know, that's, everyone's got their own taste buds. And if you have someone experienced enough, I can help lead you into the path to get you the best tasting oyster for you. What are you in a taste for right now when it comes to oysters? <laughs> um, I, I have like my top 10 oysters. Mostly they are East Coast species uh, because the Virginia cat, the South Carolina native, uh, that's what I grew up eating. Um, but I had one that popped up very recently when I was managing at Nico. I brought in some of the first European oysters, like set and farm raised in Europe, uh, to the United States in almost 50 years. Um, these were actually an Asian species called the Gigas that were farm raised in Zeeland, which is south of Holland, the Netherlands. Right. And unlike our West Coast Gigas, which are very like heavy, um, melon and sweet, you know, and you get the seaweed and a little bit of like sprinkled sea salt over top. Yes. These were very Atlantic high brine where the melon and everything was much more subtle. And I loved that. I was like, wow, you know, I get this little flavor that I enjoy, but I won't sit there and eat a dozen of them because now I have that high brine. So really these Zeeland uh, Netherlands oysters are really what I have a taste for right now if I can get my hands on them. Um, every day outside of that, because that might be a little bit of rare. Uh, I'm kind of going Maine uh, because I like stuff uh, out of like the Tusca Bay, uh, which has a very clean high salt. And I can pick up uh, more nuances like uh, uh, metallic or corn. And then I start thinking, hey, it's like a can of sweet corn, you know, but uh, that's just me. Yeah, oh, no, I completely understand that. And I was wondering, which one of those oysters right now that you would love to bring here to the South? introduce us to if there's any oyster i could bring in today to introduce to uh most people who haven't had it uh would probably um be the olympia uh the reason being it is native to north america uh most people think west coast oysters are actually like the kumamotos and the gigas which are two species that were brought over from asia because they farm really well uh, the Giga is one of the fastest growing oysters. It's very hardy. It goes everywhere. Um, so that's what a lot of people think about. They don't think of this oyster that doesn't get bigger than the size of a quarter, you know, that has a very flat shell. And if you're walking along a pebble beach, you'll probably just walk right past it and not even realize there's an oyster. But it's this little tiny oyster, circular. The muscle's almost in the middle, but you bite into it. And it is one of the most heavily packed flavor bombs you'll ever have. And, you know, even though some of the flavors that has, like, there are some copper notes to it, you know, be wary of that copper, but it is so subtle and so small with all the other flavors that you can actually kind of sit there and enjoy it. And to me, it's just something really nice that you don't get too often to try this native species that was almost completely wiped out, um, actually by miners 
when they went over there because they would just use it as a cheap food source. Um, so yeah, that would be something I would love to share more with uh, with our low country. What one of these oysters describes you? <laughs> oh God, that's a good question. Um, I probably. I mean, I like to think of myself as like a South Carolina, like roasted oyster and an oyster roast because that's where it all started for me. Um, you know, I, I got like a rough exterior, but I'm really like soft and sweet on the inside and, you know, very warm and loving, you know, but it's sometimes a little hard to get around all the other shells and, you know, get that nice little beautiful one. Um, so yeah, I think that the best way to describe me maybe is that, you know, um, and unfortunately, you know, I think we all, as we grow, we get maybe a little bit harder outer shells, you know, we try to protect ourselves, but we have this, you know, really nice, soft, warm inside. Um, but yeah, that would be, I think the truest oyster for me, you know, it's what I like to represent when I go abroad. Like I go to France, I go to Canada, or, you know, wherever it might be in the world. And I try to bring the knowledge of our unique species with us, you know, and I also kind of, I, I think that is kind of, kind of me, you know? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. What do you want to learn next when it comes to oysters? Uh, you know, I've learned a lot. I've worked on farms. I've worked at all bars. I've, I've traveled pretty much, you know, everywhere you can to see and, and work with oysters. Um, for me, my personal growth area is probably more on, like, the nuances with uh, uh, the actual breeding of oysters um, and how that works. The spawning process, the water temperatures, you know, why certain oysters take off in some areas better than others, you know, where some would become a dominant species like the Giga here. Um, that's things that have kind of a very small outer, you know, maybe a macro sense of knowledge, but I want a micro sense, you know, I really want to understand it in its final points. Yeah, absolutely. And, and when you look back at the time you started, you know, with oysters to right now, what is the biggest difference about oysters? Uh, I think in Charleston, especially in 2009, when we opened a Men's Street, it was just us and pearls. I know that their oyster, we called them parlors back in the day, you know, turn of the century, going back like 1880s and stuff. But for a long time, the raw bar wasn't a big focal point. And I think a Men and pearls, you know, and then the ones that come on, like the Darling and stuff later, proved that is a big facet in the Charleston industry. Um, so for me, I think that has been the biggest change is just seeing how the Charleston culinary scene has evolved to being very, you know, oyster forward, which is really nice. Oh, absolutely. So. Absolutely. And for someone who wants to get more educated on oysters or want to book you for an event, how can they go about that? Um, I do have, uh, like my social media, Holy City Oyster Maven. Um, I am working on my website, Shuck Girl. Uh, it is still in the process of, you know, figuring out the nuances of, you know, how to, for me personally to update, you know, the events I'll be at. Um, but yes, uh, I will, I'm always posting on my socials where I'm doing, uh, programs. I'm working with wine shops to bring, uh, oyster classes, uh, there. So, you know, you can enjoy wine or if I'm at a brewery beer and I'll talk about how to pair that with uh with your oysters and you know how those flavors work well together. Work well together. What flavors actually meets your type of style when it comes to being in the kitchen with the oysters? Uh, uh scotch. <laughs> I love scotch. Um I think scotch and whiskeys make great pairings for oysters. And I wouldn't say that's very traditional. Most people are gonna <laughs> want to put like a Chardonnay or like a white wine with it, with it, something sparkling. Um, but if you're pairing the right oyster, uh, scotches actually can work very well. And for, um, guess kind of like an example, you can do, uh, you know, go in the route that you're normally drinking. One of my good friends, Gardner Douglas, the oyster ninja out of DC, he loves beer, he, you know, and, uh, I think that's his main focus of, you know, alcoholic consumption. So he's been doing a lot of series through his podcast about how to pair a uh, beer with oysters. Um, you know, I think cocktails are a great, uh, great mix, uh, because you can, you know, take a nice, uh, liquor you like, but add something, um, that would heighten the oyster, uh, like some rosemary or lemon, 
uh, maybe some sea salt to it. Uh, but yeah, don't limit yourself by all means. And don't only drink scotch, because I say to drink scotch. But um, if we sit down for a scotch and oyster class, I could probably sell you on how those can also be a very lovely pairing together. And that's the question I wanted to ask you, Miss Isabella, earlier. How do you put those oysters out there right now and not limit yourself? Um, how do I pick the oysters? Yeah, how do you, you know, for that's, instance, yeah. That would definitely be a case-by-case case basis. Um, for instance, I, I did a, uh, I wanted to do something fun for the Kentucky Derby, and I had an oyster class that same week. Well, not on the same day, but, you know, close enough. And so I was trying to think, like, hoist, uh, Horses, you know, they're running really fast around the track. So how can I relate that to oysters? And I went with oysters from the Gulf Coast because you can get oysters that are that, you know, three and a half or two and a half to three inches. I was talking about in under a year. They grow really fast. Wow. Um, their meat flavors are very sweet, mm. uh, creamy, um, you know, like white uh, sugars uh, in a sense. But I was like, how do I, you know, do something fun on the cocktail end of this? You know, and I, I thought like mint juleps and stuff. So I used the Charleston tea plantation teas and I made these pre-batched tea cocktails with different spirits, you know, and paired them together. Oh, hey, there we go. Yeah. You know, <laughs> yeah. So I had three tea cocktails and I was like, at your party, you can make these pre-batch. Here's like the recipe. Look how nicely these, you know, go with these oysters. Um, you know, so it's really just kind of, I, I wouldn't say trial and error when you're putting this stuff together, uh, but really just kind of thinking of how you would, uh, arrange any kind of, uh, plating or cocktail. So I would definitely take it very case by case when I'm selecting an oyster program. Um, just off the rip, if anyone came to me and said, what should I put on my raw bar? I would say one Northeast, you know from like essentially New York to Maine, mm. uh, one mid Atlantic. So like Chesapeake Bay, one, something from like North Carolina, South Carolina, maybe a Gulf coast, you know, uh, and that would give people a nice understanding of how the same species can take on so many different flavors and looks through the oyster. Oh man, absolutely. Absolutely. And Louisville's on my list of places to visit this summer. So I'm looking forward to that. That's awesome. <laughs> Indeed, Absolutely. Well, Miss Isabella McBath, Thank you so much for your time. And again, welcome to Quentin's Close-Ups. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's been a blast. Likewise. Thank you so much.